Hello, America. I'm Mark Levin. This is Life, Liberty, and Levin. We have a tremendous guest, Kenneth Starr. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks, Mark. I must confess, we're good friends. You're a good man. Thank you. Former so are you. Well, thank you. <laughs> former Solicitor General, former federal judge, former independent counsel. And your appearance couldn't be more important right now. So let's jump in. We have independent counsel Robert Mueller. He's got his team. He's actually special counsel. You were independent counsel under a specific statute, and you had obligations under that statute that you had to follow. He has a different statute with fewer obligations. Um, and I wanted to ask you a question, and I've thought about this a lot. As I watch the coverage of Robert Mueller, I find out he's the most noble man to ever work, walk the earth. <laughs> and so is his staff. I find members of Congress trying to pass laws to protect him from what I don't know. Uh, and I remember when you were an independent counsel, we had the paparazzi media on your front step. I saw you come out with a cup of coffee every now and then. We knew when you came up in the morning, when you went to bed at night. Kind of different coverage. You were criticized constantly by the media. He's defended by the media. What do you make of that? Uh, night and day, well, apples and oranges. Uh, the press knew where I lived, and they camped out. Also, they camped outside frequently, not always, camped outside uh, our offices in Washington, D.C. Very different. They don't do that for Mueller. Why is that? It's very nice of them. Yes. And, and honestly, I was curious. I asked someone in Washington, hey, does people not know where Bob Mueller lives? I don't wish him that kind of invasion of privacy, but... Uh, you know, we lived in a nice suburban uh, area of McLean, Virginia. In North I remember your house. It was very nice. Yeah, it's simple. We, we, some of my it's friends all over TV. So, so <laughs> our Brady Bunch house. Yes. Uh, we had a carport, not a garage, and so forth. So, but Madison Court is not a great name. We lived in Madison Court, and the press was pretty much ubiquitous. But why do you think? the distinction, the difference in coverage. There's got to be a treaty of peace that with the uh, networks, platforms, and so forth, they said, we're going to leave him alone. They like him. They didn't like you. Do you think it's because of who you were investigating and who he's investigating? I mean, isn't that a logical conclusion? It's a very logical conclusion. Uh, Someone who's investigating the president is likely to be very unpopular with uh, with a whole bunch of people, maybe 50 percent, 45 percent of the American people. But uh, the the media as a whole, even though there were some great heroes in the media as far as uh, my own investigation was uh, concerned. But the media as a whole, uh, I think, is pretty sympathetic to those who are investigating a Republican, Watergate, Richard Nixon. Uh, and then maybe not so those investigating a Democrat, and especially a very uh, well-liked, uh, controversial, though he was, but Bill Clinton was likable, empathetic, charming, uh, and he also was very effective at using surrogates to attack the investigation, whereas uh, President Trump has chosen, I think unwisely, to do the attacks himself. You and your investigation were attacked relentlessly. Were there any efforts by members of Congress to protect your investigation, to protect your appointment? Were there any sympathetic voices in most of the media? I know there were a few reporters who were actually reporters, but as a whole, it was pretty dastardly, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I would say no uh, with respect to members of Congress. Uh, there, there may have been some speeches on the floor from time to time. Then when the going really got rough during the Monica Lewinsky phase of the investigation and the press criticism became extremely intense, uh, I do remember vividly a call from Senator Orrin Hatch saying, Ken, you need to get out there. And it wasn't that I was hiding for reasons we've already discussed. You need to get out there. You should do this and you should do that. My friend Ted Olson said, you need to go on Larry King Live. Remember those days? And he just gives you the microphone. You can say what you want to say. But I felt at that time, and I was wrong, I felt at that time that I needed to be much more discreet, <laughs> careful. There were times when I would go before the media. There were times that we provided public information. Uh, out of the uh, investigation without running afoul. Here's the key. Don't reveal grand jury information because that's a crime. 
I have no idea what Robert Mueller's voice sounds like. He doesn't speak to the public. I don't mean leaking. I'm talking about something else. Uh, we don't get many press releases from the special counsel's office. Um, I have my own views of leaks and so forth. But isn't there an obligation, the U.S. Attorney's Office, your office, you at least communicated some information to the American people, given the power of the office, and given the reach of the office, and given the fact it involves an elected president of the United States and the people surrounding him? I, I err on the side of providing public information. I think it is an issue of accountability and responsibility. It's nowhere in the statute, right? It's just a judgment call. Are you going to try to uh, educate the, the public as appropriate without besmirching people's reputations? I think that's one of the key things that we're going to be seeing in the Mueller investigation. One of the things prosecutors should not do is go hammer someone <laughs> in the public domain. Uh, you either present an indictment to the grand jury or you don't. You know who agrees with you? Who? The late Leon Jaworski, yeah. who was involved in the Watergate yeah. matter, because that was really a new area. And when he came to writing a report, they were somewhat criticized. He said, look, I'm not going to write a report that starts trashing people or insinuating things that I couldn't bring to court or I couldn't prove. That would be a bigger abuse of power than some of these people that I'm investigating. You, you concur with that? I can completely concur. I mean, he wrote the so-called road map, Breaking tonight, but it didn't President fill Trump in a whole lot of details because by Even definition, of one of it's going to be a one-sided uh, report. Right? It's not going to reflect. On the other hand, there's another way of looking at this set of facts or this particular uh, testimony. So I think it is a matter of fundamental fairness that prosecutors who do have this great power should not prosecute uh, by press release uh, or uh, by innuendo and public comments. Why is that? It's because of our sense of fairness and, and justice, uh, life and liberty. You know, we have in this country the baseline of liberty and your liberty is to a certain extent being the liberty of your reputation. You know, reputation, and if you, the late Vince Foster said, who took his own life, and that was part of our investigation. And just two months before he took his own life, he said to the graduates of the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville, and I think this makes the point, in our profession, he's a lawyer, in our profession, if you lose your reputation, you lose everything. Well, reputation is just an important period. That's why the law protects reputations from defamation, from libel and slander and the like. It's an important part of our decency as a human being that we don't go besmirching another human being. Or if we do, then we might have to face a civil action. Particularly, it would seem to me, in the criminal context, you're a prosecutor. You have enormous power, particularly a special counsel. I would say has more power than your typical U.S. attorney. And um, we have a Bill of Rights for a reason. Due process, presumption of innocence. You have a right to cross-examine witnesses. You have a right to see the charges that are going to be brought against you and so forth. In this case, with Robert Mueller, the report that they say is going to be released relatively soon, um, the president's lawyers haven't seen it. They haven't had an opportunity to respond to anything, to prepare a response to it. it it's not vetted through your typical courtroom. Uh, and you don't have uh, a pre, you don't have discovery, uh, pre-discovery where, you know, depositions and questions, none of that. You have a prosecutor writing a report, whatever that report says, without any checks and balances whatsoever. He's not a judge and he's not a jury. What is, and yet this statute tried to limit the power of a report, unlike your statute that you worked under and the independent counsel statute. Explain. Well, the independent counsel statute, which has gone away, it existed for 21 years, was really putting a pretty heavy thumb on the scales toward impeachment. Remember, it was passed in the wake of uh, Watergate, so the country had been through an impeachment process, the president resigned. So what do we want this special prosecutor, whatever we call him, independent counsel, special counsel, what do we want that person to do? Well, we want that person not just to make prosecutorial decisions, we want the person to write a report. And we want the person to send, send that report to the House of Representatives. It's one of the reasons, Mark, that uh, Justice Antonin Scalia and his magnificent dissent 
the case that upheld the constitutionality of the independent counsel statute said this statute is, he used these great terms, acrid with the smell of impeachment. That's been improved. Under the regulations under which Bob Mueller was uh, uh, appointed, there is a reporting requirement, but it is a confidential report under these regulations to go to the attorney general. Then the attorney general is to give a report, not to say, oh, here's the Bob Mueller report. So the attorney general of the United States, uh, Bill Barr, is going to have to make a judgment. What am I as attorney general going to report up to Congress? So it's really a completely different reporting requirement. Completely. And yet people talk about this as the impeachment report. Is it because of things that Nancy Pelosi and Gerald Nadler have said that we want to see this report before we make decisions about impeachment, which they know they don't even have a right to see this report? I think there's a failure to understand, to drill into the regulations uh, under which Mueller was appointed. Now, the regulations could be jettisoned, right? They said, okay, we're not going to use those regulations anymore. But those regulations have been in effect in both Republican and Democrat administrations. They came into being in the Clinton administration. So they sort of stood the test of time. 20 years you said they've been there. They have been around for a while. And so we, I don't know how many special counsels have been appointed. But the point is, those regulations have been there on the books for Congress to look at. And if Congress had come to the judgment that it liked the old system of a full report, to the Congress of the United States, it should have stepped in long before now. I think there's an assumption that may that isn't grounded in the text of the regulations. When we come back, I want to discuss with you these recent revelations by Andrew McCabe and others. What's been going on at the FBI? You worked at the Justice Department. I worked at the Justice Department. You were a Solicitor General at the Justice Department. I was Chief of Staff at the Justice Department. This FBI situation is very, very troubling, and I want to pursue that with you in a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, you can join us on Levin TV. That's Levin TV by going to blazetv.com slash mark to sign up. We'd love to have you. blazetv.com slash mark or give us a call at 844-LEVIN-TV. That's 844-LEVIN-TV. We'll be right back. Ken Starr, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Now, when you were at the Justice Department, there were different directors. Bill Webster, who else was the director there? Um, Louis Free, when I was Louis Free, uh, independent counsel. Federal judge. Bill Sessions. Uh, Bill Sessions. Free, yeah, was a federal judge. All three. There was really no controversy, at least with respect to the first two. Um, do you ever recall the director of the FBI, the deputy director of the FBI, the general counsel of the FBI, leaking? Were you aware of, when you were with the Justice Department, that they would have been leaking? No, and it would have been really out of character for both Judge Bill Webster and Judge uh, Louis Frey. Uh, those were straight shooters. They were honest as the day is long. They really embodied the goals and values of the FBI. The FBI, fidelity, bravery, integrity, and that integrity word is so terribly important because we've got to believe in the honesty uh, of law enforcement. The FBI has an enormous amount of power, so the person at the top sets the tone, and they set a great tone. A high moral tone. Well, we have the former deputy director of the FBI, Andrew McCabe. He's made a lot of news lately with a 60 Minutes interview, and he's on a celebrity tour, basically, hawking his book on nighttime shows, and, which is a remarkable thing to me. Because on 60 Minutes, from my perspective, he confessed to a cabal over there at the Justice Department that was trying to trigger the 25th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. Clearly, they never read it, because it's a complicated amendment. Uh, and there's no role whatsoever for the FBI. And he says in part that the reason that he, he was concerned about this is because the president fired Comey. Well, the president fired Comey, and among those recommending his firing was the deputy attorney general of the United States, Mr. <laughs> Rosenstein. He says, well, the president asked me, you're the deputy attorney general of the United States. You can do it or not do it. And then they talk about the Deputy Attorney General of the United States talking about, he disagrees with this, wiring himself. Mm. Wiring himself to do what? To talk to the President of the United States about firing Comey, which he recommended? 
I must say, I see this as a cabal. I see this as an effort to overthrow a sitting president. I have never seen anything like this. I don't think anything like this has happened in modern American history. I'm curious to know what your take is on it. I was uh, deeply disappointed, uh, and frankly, I was uh, both saddened and angered to uh, read about and to hear about now with the recent uh, reports from uh, the former acting director of the FBI. I mean, who do they think they are? Uh, they're part of the executive branch, and the idea of the FBI, with all of its authority, all of its power, and it has an enormous amount of power, turning that power in a direction against a duly elected president of the United States uh, is, is appalling unless there was some reasonable ground to believe that the president was engaged in criminal conduct or that the president had become an agent of a foreign government. There's, to me, zero evidence that President Trump, whether one loves him or does not love him, was in any way an agent of any foreign power he had relationships, obviously, but who doesn't who's coming into the presidency? But I just think it was an enormously poor judgment on the part of the leadership of the FBI. And it's really a kind of who do you think you are? You're part of the executive branch, and this is really above your pay grade. At a minimum, that's the kind of decision. If there was something that seriously wrong in the view of the FBI, they go knock on the attorney general's office, and the attorney general goes and knocks on the counsel of the president's office. And you do this through regular order as opposed to essentially uh, runaway cops. But I'm trying to figure out what exactly did he do that would merit this kind of rogue hysteria. He fires the... FBI director. It's the FBI director. He's allowed to fire the FBI director. He's allowed to fire pretty much whomever he wishes. It had no effect on the Russia investigation. The Russia investigation has expanded into all kinds of areas. The president hasn't interfered with their funding. Uh, as a matter of fact, Mr. McCabe testified under oath before Congress that everything's going along swimmingly with the Russia investigation, that they've gotten all the funds that they need. There's no evidence of obstruction per se. The president has the inherent power to hire and fire pretty much as he wishes. This seemed to me to be a pretext. What do you think? I don't know if it was a pretext or just an abysmal misunderstanding of our constitutional order and the power of the president. We do not have an imperial presidency. There are many checks and there are many balances, especially the United States Congress, especially the House of Representatives. If something has gone awry, the founding generation said we want that judgment as to whether to put the impeachment process in place in the people's house, not in the Senate, but in the people's house. The Senate will eventually have its role. That is the role of, in our constitutional structure, checking the president. Now, there is this 25th Amendment process in light of the assassination of John Kennedy and so forth, but that's at a level that involves the cabinet. It does not involve the Federal Bureau of Investigation with folks and no one involved in the decision were appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. That's a huge check and a huge balance that we have in our system. The idea of a PAS, presidential appointment, but Senate uh, approval. That's a check, that's a balance. So we had essentially an unaccountable branch, or the leadership, I should say, of an unaccountable part of the branch of the executive that I think was just taking uh, very strange steps. And you're right. I think, Mark, I think it was unprecedented. And it sounds in the nature of a, of, of, of a movement toward uh, a coup d'etat. Which is shocking. Ken Starr, when we come back, you've had a lot of experience with the Clintons. And the FBI has had a lot of experience with the Clintons. And I want to pursue that briefly with you. We'll be right back. Missed enough. Ask an asthma specialist about Fisenra. If you can't afford your medication, AstraZeneca may be able to help. Live from America's news headquarters, I'm Aisha Hasni. Iran reportedly test fired a cruise missile from a submarine for the first time. This during annual military drills in the Strait of Hormuz, a vital passageway for oil tankers. Iranian state media says the country has three submarines with that capability. This comes amid heightened tensions with the U.S. over President Trump's withdrawal from the 2016 Iran nuclear deal. 
Police in Texas say that two bodies were recovered from the site where a Boeing 767 cargo plane crashed into Trinity Bay near Houston. Crews are still searching for the body of a third person. According to the NTSB, the plane did not transmit a distress signal before the crash, but a nearby security camera captured video of the plane nosediving. I'm Aisha Hasni. Now back to Life, Liberty and Levin. Ken Starr, you're like an expert on the Clintons. I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but you've written this outstanding book, Contempt, a memoir of the Clinton investigation. So I want to ask you about the Clintons. We're said that the, the comments the president makes about this investigation, about the FBI, are unprecedented. Are they unprecedented? No. Uh, I wish the president, in the exercise of his discretion, would leave the nasty job of attacking the prosecutor to others, but he does it himself. Uh, he is his uh, own follower of his own instincts. He's transparent. At, uh, that, that he is. Uh, uh, Bill and Hillary were more clever, uh, if I may say so. I think it's more clever because they were... Uh, or more devious. Uh, d definitely more devious uh, because they would attack the investigation and the investigators the prosecutor and the prosecutors indirectly through surrogates, especially James Carville, Sidney Blumenthal, and other members of uh, the Clinton cast. So Louis Free, the FBI director, doing much of this, he would be attacked. Was he persona non grata at the White House? As far as I understand it, yes, that uh, Judge Free, Louis Free, was an absolute uh, straight shooter, uh, just rock-ribbed uh, integrity, uh, and that didn't play well in, in the Clinton White House. I recall even Janet Reno was frowned upon, and they started taking shots at her through the media, too, through surrogates. Is that correct? Yeah, throughout the first term, Mark, the first Clinton term, she was appointing a number of independent counsel. I had lots of company. Uh, and just by way of example, Henry Cisneros. Uh, and there really was some culpability uh, there, uh, a guilty plea by Linda Medlar and so forth. So these names from the past. But the point is, she was calling them as she saw them. I think she was being honest and straightforward. But things then changed when the calls came after the 96 election for the appointment of an independent counsel to look into campaign finance and for perhaps a possibility of foreign campaign. Johnny Chung, I remember all these. All, all these the things. The Riotti group. group, yeah. Yeah. And she said, and, and Louis Free, as I recall, Mark, recommended the appointment of an independent counsel. She brought in a special counsel to assess the evidence and to make a recommendation. Uh, and he recommended the appointment of an independent counsel. She refused to do that. Now, Throughout the investigation till the Monica Lewinsky phase, she was cooperative. She didn't get in the way. In fact, she gave us, as you may recall, additional assignments to look into the travel office firings. That was an add-on. She kept plopping them on top of you. Yeah. And I also remember discussion about removing her and replacing her with a new attorney general. That kind of discussion took place, too. So it's important that the American people understand context, understand precedent, we're told these things going on today have never happened before. The things going on today that have never happened before, as far as I'm concerned, involves a lot of what's taking place at the FBI. Mm. John Solomon of the Hill just reported just a few days ago that testimony provided to Congress behind closed doors by the general counsel of the FBI, who is now under James Baker under investigation himself, he said right up to the last moment he believed Hillary Clinton should be charged with felony violations of the Espionage Act. And that it wasn't until the last moment he was convinced that they didn't have enough proof to demonstrate she had intent, specific intent. Now that's an interesting point because the statute doesn't talk about specific intent. This espionage statute has been around over a hundred years. It talks about gross negligence, which does not require specific intent. What do you make of this? That the, uh, I mean, it's really, it's really confounding in many ways. First, Comey clears Hillary Clinton in a bizarre press conference. He doesn't even talk to the Attorney General. One of the things the Inspector General complained about was that he undermined her authority. That's the Attorney General's decision, whether somebody's 
charged or prosecuted, not the director of the FBI. Then a few days before the election, oh, we have more emails, and then quickly over the weekend they say, but don't worry, everything's fine. Uh, and then we have this general counsel now saying, or he said, uh, I thought she should have been charged all along, but I was convinced at the end. What do you make of what took place at the FBI? The FBI should have been in full consultation with the Justice Department. He used the term, Mark, undermining the authority of the Attorney General by the way Jim Comey conducted himself. I would say he usurped authority. And that's what the Rod Rosenstein memo said in May leading up to the firing of, of James uh, Comey by the President of the United States. Uh, I wish the President had taken this action much earlier. I think we would have avoided an enormous amount of grief had he, because uh, Jim Comey, and you and I are both alums of the Justice Department, and we know the hierarchy, and he knew the hierarchy. He had served in the Justice Department. So this was not inadvertent. He took the authority of the Attorney General and assumed that for himself. And then there may have been a very weak legal analysis going into the usurpation of, of authority. That is a misreading of the statute. Because Mr. Baker, the former general counsel, was after all the general counsel. He's the lawyer to the FBI. And so you would think that his view would carry a special weight in terms of the meaning of the statute. And he thought, according to these, uh, the testimony that we're now seeing, that she had in fact committed crimes. One of the reasons that I chose to write this book about the Clinton investigation is we felt that Hillary Clinton was guilty of crimes in the Arkansas phase of the investigation. We couldn't prove it. Prosecutors will frequently say there's a difference between what I know and what I can prove. And because of missing witnesses, Susan McDougall, for example, would not uh, agree to testify. She went into contempt of court. The name of the book, Contempt, the President was held in contempt. So, th th but the point is, the independent counsel statute contemplates working with the FBI, but it wasn't the FBI that was making these decisions as to whether to prosecute Jim Guy Tucker or anyone else. It was the uh, responsibility of the Justice Department or the independent counsel. So in this FBI, you had at least some of them pushing for the 25th Amendment. You had them making decisions they had no power to make. I would say to another Jim Comey McCabe, we had a rogue FBI. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. Entrust your heart to Entresto. The beat goes on. Ken Starr, I want to ask you about congressional oversight. The Democrats have multiple committees starting multiple investigations on anything you can think of related to Trump and Trump world. <laughs> now, you know, I look at the Constitution, I look at the history of hearings, the history of what Congress does and maybe what it shouldn't do. It has legitimate oversight function. There's no question about that. Its job is to legislate. So it kind of needs to know what's going on. But that's not what's going on. If you want 10 years of the president's past tax returns, or you want access to the Deutsche Bank information from the past, and they say we need to look at these things also because of potential impeachment. It talks about high crimes and misdemeanors, among other things, while he's president of the United States. The American people elected this man, despite the fact he wouldn't release his tax returns. And by the way, members of Congress aren't required to release their tax returns either, including Nancy Pelosi. If I'm the president of the United States and I've got good lawyers, I'm going to say, you know what? I'm not giving you that information. Mm. You have no legitimate legislative basis for it whatsoever, other than to try and harass me, uh, to try and ruin my businesses and my family. So I'll see you in court. Ultimately, I'll see you in the Supreme Court. What's your take on this? I think you're on to something. Uh, the legislative oversight power is in furtherance of the responsibilities given to Congress under Article I. Uh, conducting a tax investigation is nowhere near the powers of Congress under Article I, Section 8. And it's almost sounding in the nature of uh, a bill of attainder. It's violating the idea of we don't pass laws or investigate individuals qua individuals. 
unless it's relating again to our legislative function. What is it that we're elected to do? We're here to oversee the executive branch and to pass laws and so forth. Uh, so I think there is a serious question under separation of powers. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that because too many times uh, as we march on in our 200, you know, third century as a constitutional republic, we don't return to these fundamental constitutional principles of, wait a second, what's your job, Congress? Mr. President, are you exceeding your powers? Courts, are you exceeding your powers? These are questions that we should continually ask, and I think it's a very important question in terms of seeking the president's tax returns. And you and I discuss these things. Very few other people do. The debate over the report is, when will it be released? What will it contain? Not a debate over the fact of a report. The debate over congressional investigations isn't a debate over, well, what are they allowed to investigate under our Constitution? What are the limits? As opposed to, well, they get 10 years of tax returns, or what will be in the tax returns? It needs to relate to the legislative authority, legislative power. Exactly. And yet our media really do the drumbeat for this sort of thing. Uh, they're not particularly uh, informed or literate in these areas, and they don't particularly care to be. Your dealings with the media uh, were very difficult, and yet from time to time you found reporters, I think, who were real reporters. Tell me about that. There's no question. Uh, I divided the uh, media during the investigation resulting now in this, in this uh, book into truth seekers and everybody else. And the good news is during that time there were some serious truth seekers. Uh, Jeff Gertz of the New York Times, Steve Labaton of the New York Times, Sue Schmidt of the Washington Post, Lisa Myers of NBC News, who broke the Juanita Broderick uh, story, a very inflammatory story that the then Attorney General of Arkansas and future president per perhaps committed uh, actual forcible rape. Uh, these were real truth-seeking people, and then there were those who were in the other camp, non-truth seekers. They were heavily outnumbered, weren't they? I seem to see, I wanted to see more truth seekers uh, than, than we had. And so a lot of the uh, material that went out into the public domain was essentially an echo chamber from what White House press spokespeople were saying, criticisms of the investigation, let's change the subject, let's attack the investigator. And one of the things that Hillary, of course, was extremely effective at doing as a student of Saul Alinsky and Rules for Radicals is, go after and destroy the other side. Personalize it, target the person. They did it to you. Do you think that's being done to the President of the United States right now? Can you it, turn on a cable show without him being called a racist or a Nazi or a Stalinist or a dictator or the person who's triggered this kind of action and that kind of action? I mean, I can't. I wish there was a restoration of civility. Uh, recently, uh, the American Charter of Conscience was uh, re released, and that American Charter, I wish, were in every journalist's uh, must-read package. Because one of the other things it says, look, we have to disagree with one another, and hopefully, and we don't have to, but we should choose to disagree with one another in a much more civil way and to be respectful of one another. But this constant calling uh, into question motives and the name calling and so forth has just re resulted, I think, in the American people saying, you know, I really don't like this. I don't like the tone, don't like the attitude and so forth. And I think everybody needs to just stop yelling at one another and have a more reasoned discourse. Don't forget, folks, almost every weeknight you can watch me on Levin TV. We'd love you to join us over at Levin TV. Here's how you do it. Call 844-LEVIN-TV, 844-LEVIN-TV, or go to blazetv.com slash mark. That's blazetv.com slash mark. Join our big, wonderful, conservative organization right there. We'll be right back. Here's off your first order. You know, Ken Starr, uh, over two years now, we've been told the President of the United States has been colluding with the Russians. I've never understood what that means, by the way. Does that mean you have a drink with a Russian? I mean, I have Russian heritage. If I talk to the President, is that a Russian thing? So it's this ambiguous term, colluding with the Russians. And it's ambiguous for a reason, because you can pour whatever mental image you 